Every year in the late summer, violent tropical storms descend on Liberia in West Africa. The small country, seemingly forsaken by God, has little choice but to accept its fate. The rain bodes ill for Fafana and his small pickup. Like all the bush taxi drivers, he knows the downpours will make his life difficult. But he remains in good spirits. I want money. Yeah, money. I'm never tired. If you're tired and do nothing, what will you eat? For several weeks, the capital, Monrovia, has been subjected to a deluge. Within minutes, the town is paralyzed and reduced to almost total chaos. And it's the same story throughout the country. In such conditions, Fafana has trouble getting to work at the taxi terminus. passes Monrovia's main market, which has shut down. The torrent of rain has forced the merchants to close shop. To blame are the sewers, which are blocked and overflowing. A Chinese company was meant to have cleaned them out. Come here, look at the rain's flooding. And the rain has forced us to put our goods higher. We're not making any money right now. The government has to do something. The sewers are too small and they're overflowing. The Chinese just took the money and ran. Red light parking is the collective taxi station, the jumping off point for all travel in Liberia. Destroyed by 15 years of civil war, Liberia has little infrastructure and the countryside lacks just about everything. Travelers supply it using the bush taxis. Fafana's cab is ready to leave. Yeah. You haven't loaded enough rice? Go on, there's still room. We can load up more. <laughs> Fafana's four-wheel drive is already crushed by the weight of its load, but to make extra money, he's happy to go over the limit. No problem, we can load another 30 bags. Okay, we'll load up another 30 bags and five cartons. My car's very powerful, very strong. You can load rocks, pack it with bags until the suspension breaks. My car is called No Bad Days. You'll see how she handles the mud. This car, nobody. Come on, get on board, make room there. Yeah, okay, okay. No, they get going there. Fafana's pickup seems to absorb an infinite number of passengers and bags of rice, so long as all are perfectly stacked. To get to Greenville on the other side of the country, Fafana is asking for a small fortune, the equivalent of two weeks' pay. I'll take 20 euros per passenger. Why is it so expensive? Because the road is so challenging. There are so many accidents, cars overturning, others stuck in ditches. It's the same, day and night, night and day. From Monrovia to Greenville, Fafana will need to deal with a road that snakes through mud for about 300 kilometers. Liberia is a country under reconstruction. Much of its population make hardly enough to buy food, and in the country, everyone, including children, are made to work. A life of misery that is shamelessly exploited by the evangelical church. If you have banknotes of 150, bring them. If you have banknotes of 100, bring those too. Give them to God, he will bless you. Despite all the prayers, nothing comes to relieve the plight of those forced to hit the road. We're not animals.
Alfana's 11 passengers are anxious about the journey. Not much still works on the pickup, that he's patched up as best as he can. Uh, you don't need a key? Yeah. No? Well, here it is anyway. Does the car work? Yeah, yes. My car. I've been driving this car for 10 years. We'll do a little over 300 kilometers. I'm a 200 mash. All too soon, and the first problems arise. The rain has turned the road into an undefined track churned up by the never-ending flow of trucks. There are always accidents here. Overloaded cars tip over often. These old beaten up trucks transport timber. You see that? But the lumber companies don't care about the state of the roads. All they want is wood. The government should really make them repair the roads. The kilometers slip by, the axle strains and the suspension is suffering. The passengers put up with it all too. Age 21, Fafana takes the bumps and the terrible roads in his stride. His only fear is the bandits that live in the forests. The highwaymen hold up travelers. They steal money and goods. And then they disappear into the forest. We're scared of them because we have nothing with which to defend ourselves, and they're armed. And sometimes people are killed. The town isn't much safer, but Fafana has no choice. He needs to fill up at the only pumps on the journey. The service station never shows the prices. Listen, uh, how much for 20 litres? Well, same as usual. Filling the tank is often a dodgy business. You soon realise you have no idea how much gas has been pumped into the tank. The attendant claims he's put in four extra litres. Listen, I've paid, so you can't complain. I'm not a thief, but you're trying to rip me off. You haven't given me what I've paid for. I've given you the money. I've paid you already. Now give me another four litres and we're done. No, 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 I won't. I've already given you 25 litres. What? 25 litres? How can you say that? OK, all right, have your four litres. Go on, give me another six litres. Look at him now, he wants another six. Move over there. The new government of Liberia does what it can to repair the roads destroyed by 15 years of savage warfare. On this stretch, it's constructing a vital new bridge. It's a tough challenge. The methods are crude and speed is essential. The old makeshift bridge could collapse at any time. The man in charge has also done what he can. As you see there, this... You see the bridge? It won't last another two years. Well, oh, it'll probably collapse before then. Every time a truck passes, the bridge bends under its weight. It's very dangerous, and the way it shakes is worrying. The wooden scaffolding barely remains standing. Next few few minutes, you can have... There might be a storm at any time. This is how the situation it could be sunny and 30 minutes later you could have a terrible downpour. The water levels can rise very quickly and if you're working here it's best to abandon work and try and escape. Even if you're working down there you have to leave. Moving over the fragile structures above the water involves some acrobatics, especially given the workers often don't have proper shoes. My shoes are too old, and I can't afford new ones. When I started working here, my shoes were brand new, but all the climbing has totally worn them out.
Everything is in short supply in Liberia, even the most basic material. Gravel, for instance, it's indispensable for making concrete. But in a country undergoing reconstruction, there's not one company that produces it. Instead, for a handful of Liberian dollars, it's the poorest that head to the quarries to break up the rocks into pebbles. Some are barely 10 years old. How old are you? Yeah. How old? Six. Five. Five? Six. No, six. Do you go to school? No. Marie has shown up early this morning with her children. All day in the sun, they break up rocks. I'm here because times are hard. I bought a lot of rocks for two euros. I make it into gravel and then I sell it to make some money to feed my kids. My husband abandoned my kids and me two years ago. I have no man to help me now. How many children do you have? I have eight. Three small ones go to school, but not the biggest one. She doesn't go to school? I hope to sign Fatu up for school this year, but for the time being I don't have enough money. When I see my friends going to school, I tell my mother that I want to go too. She says she has no money. She needs to break a lot of rocks to be able to afford school. The little the family earns is not enough to pay for uniforms and school supplies. The small laborers sell the gravel to a woman in Monrovia. Everyone calls her Tati. And Tati is very particular about the size of the pebbles. I don't want big stones, just small pebbles. If anyone brings me that garbage, they won't get paid. Come on, fill up the containers all the way to the top. I'll buy them and I need to leave right away, but I want small pebbles, mind. Any big ones and I'm not paying. Let me see your pebbles, you. Look at my pebbles, Tatty. Tatty takes her time inspecting the pebbles. She shows no pity to the children who have to wait for her carrying 20 kilos of stones on their heads. I'll take those two boxes. So much hard work for so little. How much, you get? How much did you make? 50 cents. In one day, Fatu and her family make 150 Liberian dollars, the equivalent of one and a half euros. Even when Tati's truck arrives, the kids still get no relief. Breaking up and selling the rocks isn't enough. They also need to tip them into the truck's container. After 12 hours working, the family heads home. Fatu, the eldest, still has chores to do. After, she can finally revise the lessons her brothers and sisters have learned at school. Get your alphabet. My brother is teaching me to read. That way, when I do go to school, I'll already know how. Go on. Back on the mud trail, and after a day of being shaking about, Fafana's passengers are exhausted. The baby is sick and is running a fever. Even if he's wary of bandits, Fafana decides to drive through the night. The child needs to see a doctor as soon as possible.
But suddenly, in the middle of nowhere, the road is blocked. Dozens of vehicles are backed up and there's no way to get through. Fafana asks his passengers to get off. There are a lot of cars stuck here and it's the only way through. We'll need to push these cars to be able to pass by. And it's this four-wheel drive that's holding everyone up. I'm stuck. I've tried everything, but I can't get free. How long have you been stuck here? How long have you been here? Almost three hours now. If that car can pull it out of the mud, then we'll be able to get the other one out. And these two can help the other one. Slowly, slowly, we'll sort this out, one after the other. Why don't you just go around them? No, no, it's even worse that way. There's no way through there. To free the first vehicle, drivers and assistants are digging trenches. The problem is there's only one pickaxe. <laughs> the men make an extra effort, but it's all for nothing. It's decided that towing the four-wheel drive might work, and a makeshift cable is used. Ah, oh, this cable's worn out, it's old. Time passes and the various attempts all end in failure. The night is humid and cold and Fafana's passengers can only wait, stressed and hungry. Heroically, the drivers keep trying. They bring stones to fill the trenches. By three in the morning, one vehicle has been freed. But any joy is short-lived as it begins to pour again. The rescue effort is quickly abandoned. Are you still there, Fafana? Ah, OK. What's happening? Uh, well, we'll have to spend the night here. There's no alternative right now. You'll sleep here? Yeah, I'll sleep. What about the women? Where are they? Uh, under the canvas up there. Okay. So, what will you do afterwards? Well, we'll try and get going early in the morning. Uh-huh. Yes. At 5 a.m., Fafana wakes up to some good news. Wait till the other vehicles do a U-turn and then you can start up. One driver, a little smarter than the others, has found another way through the forest. What will you do? Well, I'll take the other route and get through. All the four-wheel drives reverse, but the improvised route is not an easy one. There's another road, but everyone wants to get on it at the same time. Come on, it's your go now. In a merry confusion, all the vehicles rush towards this unexpected escape route.
Fafana is overjoyed. The dreadful night is finally over. Fafana is really good. He'll always get through, no matter what. But this woman has nothing to smile about. Her baby still has a fever and is dehydrated. The baby wants a drink, but there's no water. It wants water? She needs water? Yes, but there is none. I'm not happy. Why? I'm upset for the passengers. They'll all be late now. To make up for lost time, Fafana keeps his foot on the pedal. In the early hours, it's raining again and the temperature's dropped to just 18 degrees. After a night out in the open, huddled under a makeshift cover, the passengers are frozen. Throughout the region, the rivers have burst their banks. There's a flood in the next village, but the locals are resigned. The mayor is keen to show how bad the situation is. You see over there? See? That's mine. That's where I raise chicken and pigs and a lot of other animals. Some of them are drowned. We need help. Look at my neighbors. They're flooded out. Hello. Hello. My name's George Pay. How many of you are there here? There's six of us that live here. The water has flooded everything, see? Is this your house? Yes, this is mine. Can you still cook? Is this the kitchen? Yes. But how, how can you cook here? Over there in the corridor. But the downpour doesn't spell disaster for everyone. Benford, for one, is happy when it rains. Along with his friends, Benford has created a new business. When the flood stopped road traffic, they helped travelers cross the swollen river. They just need to persuade them to give them something for their help. You can't get across without us. We'll, we'll carry your packages. That will cost 40 cents. And we'll carry your motorbike too. Really? You'll carry my motorbike? Yes, we'll carry it. Won't be expensive. Cover the exhaust pipe with a plastic bag. The bag will cost 10 cents. The current is getting stronger, and the motorbike risks being swept away. The water keeps rising, and so does the cost of a lift across. I paid 80 cents for my motorbike to be carried. These are the morning's takings, but at a cost of cold and shivering bodies. I'm going to my horse. Oh, it's too cold. I'm going home to warm up, and then I'll be back.
it's time to divvy up the money. Hey, why are you giving him some? He didn't carry anything. All right, give me my money back. Now, give me a fiver. I promise you five cents. I'll pay him and share out the rest with the kids later. We all live in the same house anyway. Oof, I'm frozen. <laughs> the priority back home is to dry off the dollars. There's never enough to last long. Benford will head off to work again in the afternoon under the rain. After the deluge, the track is reduced to a succession of muddy pools, all tricky to get through. Before each hill, the passengers have to dismount. Then they have to climb the hills on foot, through the sludge. Yet another odyssey. But it's the only way the four-wheel drives can get through. Morale isn't exactly great amongst the passengers, and there are more and more complaints. The baby's tired. Did you see the road? What a pain. Fafana, however, is in good form, showing off to keep up pretenses and possibly reassuring the passengers as well. He's not about to lose his reputation as the best driver in this part of the country. Was it easy for you? <laughs> but not everyone has his luck. A few kilometers back, Maurice, another driver, comes up against a hill. His engine is wrecked. It's no good the vehicle refuses to go forward. Assistants and passengers lend a hand and push the vehicle with its smooth tires. At any moment, the car could slide and crush them. The motor looks as if it might melt down, but Morris isn't concerned. He knows how to deal with an overheating engine. Oh, what are you doing? Well, oh, the engine's heating up, so I'm trying to cool it. And this time, with a good push, the vehicle makes it up and over the hill. From here on, the road crosses a series of rivers, and there are no bridges. It's common to be stuck for days at a time, waiting for water levels to drop. The road to Greenville is a long and painful one. We drivers suffer, yes, yes we do. The passengers also suffer. They're in a hurry to arrive, but they'll be late. The roads are just too bad. Without a four-wheel drive and a good mechanic, you would never get there. But we drivers know our own vehicles, and we always make it in the end. And as soon as Fafana starts boasting, his vehicle inevitably breaks down.
In Liberia, petrol is often of poor quality, causing the filters to get dirty easily. To Fafana, this is all routine. But the battery is also tiring. The only solution is to push. You never rest? Never. Why not? Because when I'm driving, I'm earning. You take better care of your car than your body. Yes, because if I don't make money, I won't get any respect. Not even my wife. If I'm not earning anything, she'll go off with someone else. Drivers love money. If I fall in love with a woman one day and I have no money, the woman won't stay. If I had to choose between women and money, then I'd choose money. Stop! My village is just over there. Greenville, the final destination. The passengers can breathe a sigh of relief. It's been three hard days and a harder 300 kilometers. Agnes is happy to be reunited with her family. And then it's time to pay for Fana. How much is the US dollar today? $75 for one US. Well, here's $2,000. No, no, you owe me $2,700. No, come on. $2,700. Why $2,700? $2,000 for you and $700 for your goods. Why $700? Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrence, come here. Where did that 700 come from? You told me 2,000 total at the start. What? You're crazy. I'm going to get your bags and put them back on the truck. Here, keep your money. Fafana, OK, OK, I'll pay the difference. If anything's missing, you'll be responsible. I haven't touched your stuff. I've just put it on the back of the car. Nothing's been opened. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Once it's sorted out, Fafana gets behind the wheel again. With a bit of luck, it'll take one day less to return to Monrovia. Agnes is one of the few merchants in town. With money borrowed from her father, she's bought a lot of different goods, including some very nice thongs from China. How much will you ask for them? Five a pair. You sell 500? You bought them for two and sell them for five? I see having money, I want them to follow. Well, I have nothing. I asked my father to lend me 200 US dollars. In Monrovia, I bought the thongs to make a small profit. But Fafana made me pay almost 30 US dollars. It's expensive. But I had to pay. Now she needs to sell the thongs, which might be tricky in a village where few people have money. Without hesitating, she offers the time-honored technique of credit. And that could lead to over-indebtedness. The female neighbors can't resist the thongs from the big city, and business is brisk. Each pair costs five and a half euros, cash or five euros on credit. Agnes will need to follow up often to collect the money she's owed. I don't have the 50 cents. Don't worry, I pass every day. If you have the money, give me the 50 cents now, and the rest you can pay later. By the end of the day, Agnes has only sold a few pairs on credit. To extend her client base, she rather relies on God. Amen. If 
every Sunday she visits the Pentecostal church at Greenville to pray. But to the evangelists, mass is all about money. The well-being of the soul can be bought for handfuls of Liberian dollars. As far as the pastor is concerned, there can never be enough donations. Whether you have 500 or 250, bring it! If you have 150 or 100 dollar notes, give them up. I'll take anything. Hundreds, fifties, bring it all. Don't stop. Give them to God. He will bless you. To help this racket along, there's plenty of razzmatazz. pastors have every reason to look happy. The three of them own six churches in Greenville. With seven collections in each church, they make a small fortune every Sunday. After the ceremony, the pastors have no qualms about parading about in their well-cut suits and Italian shoes. We are going to have a reception. We're going to have a little party a to let off some steam. Have fun. The Greenville Catholics aren't so lucky. Their church is in ruins and will likely remain so. Until recently, the entire village was in a similar state. What has improved matters is the arrival of a large Indonesian company, Golden, a major producer of palm oil. Every night the plantation tractor ferries the workers home. Among them is Otello, who hopes the multinational will keep investing in Greenville. This is where we live. We also are destroyed by the war. The whole neighborhood was destroyed in the war. The Liberian War. The fighting just went on and all the houses here were affected. Now there's no money to rebuild. Look at this house. It cost thousands of dollars and now it's destroyed. My father was killed in the war. And my mother too. Yes, my sister. This is my sister, Laura. Look how we live, our conditions. My sister again. This is another sister, Lisa. Here's Nora, my wife. Here's the babies. And the babies. We're about 25, we uh, live here all together, and we can just about afford a bowl of rice each every day. A bowl costs 40 cents. It's difficult, but it's the only solution. Our job is to gather the palm nuts. We need to survive and give our children food. Otello and his companions live like slaves. If they want to work, they need to wait for a long time in the village square at midnight. These people spend the entire night on the ground here. The night, they've been waiting for the tractor for hours. They wake up at midnight and sometimes wait until four or five in the morning. It's really hard. The tractor's coming now. When the headlights come into view, it's a mad rush. On the tractor, heading for the plantation, there's not enough room for everyone. This woman, scared by all the shoving, holds back. There's a tremendous struggle to get a place in the trailer. 
they miss work twice, they'll be fired. Tractor can't take all of us. There aren't enough vehicles. We won't be able to earn any money. But she'll jump on at the last moment, and the crush on board is barely supportable. We are not, we are not animals. We are not animals. About a dozen workers won't be able to get on board. Botello has found a few centimeters, and there's more than an hour's uncomfortable journey ahead. To make sure he arrives on time, the driver accelerates without a care for his passengers. Sitting here on the edge is dangerous. Every bump could throw me off. And sometimes a container opens and everyone falls off. This side here might open and everyone might just slide out. Has it ever happened? Yeah. It's sunrise, and crammed tightly together, the workers suffer in silence. On the edge of the plantation, Golden's trucks have churned up the roads. For those being transported, the discomfort continues, and even the taxi motorbikes have trouble. To make sure they arrive on time, some finish the journey on foot. It's a risky business, as they could get run over at any moment. Gradually a traffic jam forms. Then a truck sinks in the mud, and in all the chaos, eats each man for himself. The tractor advances a few meters, but has to pull up as two four-wheel drive vehicles force their way through. The second car slows down and gets stuck. And this time, the road is blocked for good. The trouble is they rip us off to get us out of this mess. We haven't caused it, and they ask for money to get us out of the mud. There they are. They are the multinational's crane drivers. Yeah, these guys are crazy. Instead of waiting for us to clear things up, they just keep trying to push their way in, and then they get bogged down. It's not our problem. You're the ones to blame for ripping up the road. Finally, the tractor breaks free of the mud. But they're late. For Otello and his unlucky comrades, risk having their pay docked. The multinational has already cleared more than 200,000 hectares of forest. Otello's work is potting the palm trees. After five years, their fruit will be squeezed to produce the prized palm oil. The extracted oil is used in food and cosmetics and is increasingly controversial. It's a profitable industry, but one that is catastrophic for the forest. As soon as one plot of land has been cleared, as many as 1,500 workers begin planting as many palm trees as possible. We have a plan, we have a plan. We have a plan. Because planting, that's all we do all day. We don't do this for, for, for money. Yeah, it's not for the money. Because our wages are ridiculous. But the money we get from this place. It's too small, it's too low. We earn just two and a half euros a day. 
What can I afford to give my family for just two and a half euros a day? The Liberian authorities have supported these efforts and have no problem in eradicating villages in the name of profit. William used to be the mayor of one such village. Over there was my village and my farm. You see these coconut palms here? They cut down hundreds of trees here. There were fruit trees. And trees everywhere. This is all that's left, look. Our own government stole and sold off our land for a pittance. Now, that's where my uncle and my father are buried. There are five family tombs here. And every day the planters leave behind a desolate landscape. After the war and the storms, Liberia is today losing its forests. The country seems destined to be abused. <laughs>